14. <laughs> Luke 14, verse 25 through 35. And we're going to finish up uh, our Lord's challenge here to us in regards to discipleship. What it costs to be a disciple. And the title of my sermon tonight is a question. Are you worth your salt? Are you worth your salt? How many have heard that expression before? Okay. How many have heard it, but it's never been explained to you? How many have heard it, and it has been explained to you? Okay, a few of us. Okay. All right, so we are going to answer the question for ourselves about ourselves. Are we worth our salt? So Luke chapter number 14, verse number 25, when you find your place there, we're going to stand and read God's word together. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Less haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand, or else... While the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. And here's our text for tonight. Verse 34 and verse 35. Salt is good. So show your doctor that verse, okay? It says right there in the Bible. Salt is good. It says about the Lord, you know, butter and honey shall he eat. Okay. Find good food in the Bible. Salt is good. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill. But men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And let's pray and we'll be seated. Lord, we thank you for your precious and holy word. What a miracle. Just the record of God himself. Emmanuel, God with us, God clothed in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. God speaking the words of everlasting life uh, to man. We thank you that we can look into your word tonight. We can see you through your word, that as we hear and do your word, we can experience you. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to choose to be your disciple, that we would choose to adhere to you, to cleave to you, to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind and strength. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be willing to, to pay the price, and we would count the cost, and we would love you then more than even our very own life and lord i pray that you would help us to answer the question tonight are we worth our salt lord we pray these things in jesus name and for his sake amen you may be seated <clears throat> uh, so this morning verse number 25 we saw that there was great multitudes found the lord jesus christ and at the beginning of his ministry that the Lord was popular. Remember, all the curses of sin were rolled away. Uh, and so if you were lame, he could make you walk. If you were uh, deaf, he could make your ears hear and uh, your blind eyes to see and your, uh, your dumb tongue uh, to speak. And, uh, and then also on top of that, uh, you were seeing very many different miracles. You were uh, eating of uh, the loaves and of the fishes that he performed that miracle twice in Scripture. 
and it was just a point of attraction. There was multitudes that were gathered around Christ, and uh, and I believe that there always has been a group of people that would at least give lip service to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just remember this, is that there is a creator God. So we, we shouldn't think of it as some uh, amazing thing that a billion people claim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in one fashion or another. Remember, by Christ, all the worlds were created. Uh, by in him we live and move and have our being by him all things consist and exist um, that doesn't mean all men that believed i remember uh, we had a soldier uh, in the church up there at fort drum and he absolutely positively uh, he loved creation science and young earth science and i i i love it too and i believe it does a great deal i believe it's mostly what it's going to do is strengthen a believer's faith but I said, you got to remember, the most wicked people in the Bible, I mean, the generation before destruction, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And let me tell you, uh, those characters believed in a young earth. You know why? It's because Noah could point over and say, there's Adam, the first man ever created. Uh, and there's the garden over there with the flaming cherubim holding a sword. Uh, and so, you know, creation science isn't going to win someone to Christ. And so they were, uh, they were believers in their mind of God, but they were not believers in their heart. You read about that in Romans chapter number one, uh, that mankind does have a knowledge of God, but does not want to retain that knowledge of God in their mind. We should remember that when we're witnessing to somebody uh, is that creation itself bears witness of a person. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ and they are a creature and they they have a witness of a creator God that created them and that creator God was the Lord Jesus Christ and so these great multitudes were surrounding the Lord Jesus and but he would turn to them and he would challenge them and we see in John 66 6, that verse is the number of man that many turned away from him then he turned to his disciples and remember what a disciple is this morning remember your two fingers one glued to the other and adherent to another and wherever one finger goes the other finger goes uh, so he turns to his disciples and Peter speaks up and finally Peter says something good you know uh, the disciple with the foot shaped mouth uh, and we also go away <laughs> where are we going to go thou hast the words of eternal life and so we see in the bottom of verse number 35 he that had ears to hear let him hear the disciples were going to be those that hear the word of god and those that do the word of god so the lord said that if you're going to follow me uh, you're not going to be able to follow the crowd he says also what you're going to have to do is die to yourself you're going to have to die to your own will and live unto the father's will and remember the lord isn't asking you to do anything that he did not do himself because he bore his cross remember in the garden he prayed father not my will but thine be done so you're going to take up your cross how often if you're going to be the disciple you're going to take up the cross every single day and then the lord said you must be willing to count the cost it's like building a tower uh, that it's going to cost you you know how much? It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you your life in totality. It's going to be the surrender of yourself unto God. Not 90%, not 99%, but 100% from head to toe, all of it needs to be surrendered unto God. And then also, he said this, realize this, if you follow me as the world hated me, even so, it's going to hate you and that you are going to be in a war that you are to count the cost and be committed to the conflict so the day that you were born again into the family of god some of us were under the persuasion that once we got saved we never sin again you ever talk to somebody said i don't know if i can get saved i don't know i think i'll still sin <laughs> well i got news for you you can talk to my wife she'll confirm this i still sin okay I'm saved and I you know why because I struggle with that flesh I've got the battle of the flesh so when you get born again 
that's when the real conflict starts. Because before, you were a part of the world, and part of the world system. You were conformed to the image of this world. Uh, but when you were born again in the family of God, you're taken out of Satan's family, and you were placed into God's family, and then all of a sudden, you're on the away team. This world is not your home. And that you're fighting a spiritual battle, and you have to understand this, and you have to be willing to be a good soldier for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, to be a disciple... It costs you everything. One person said to the reformer, uh, Martin Luther, he talked about the sacrifice, and Luther's response to him was, he said, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. And uh, another reformer, John Calvin, he said this, he says, I, I've given my all to Christ, and what have I found? my all in Christ. D.L. Moody put it this way. Let God have your life. He can do more with it than you can. Isn't that the truth? There's a man by the name of C.T. Studd. In 1877, C.T. Studd's daddy was saved uh, when D.L. Moody was preaching in England in one of his uh, evangelistic campaigns. Well, C.T. Studd was a world-famous cricket player. In case you know, cricket is not just a little thing that hops around. It is also a sport. And over in England, it was the big sport. I mean, it was like NFL football over there. And C.T. Studd uh, was a football cricket star. And everybody knew his name. And he turned his back on cricket and went to the mission field as a missionary. Uh, he came back to visit England, and he said a businessman friend, who is childhood friend, uh, gave his life to business. He was a Christian. He was very successful. Uh, and he said to CT, in somewhat regret, he said, you know, I would give everything that I possess to have the knowledge of God that you do. And CT said, well, that's exactly what it cost me. Uh, so what we find, if you save your life, you lose it. But if you lose your life, you actually found it. And so we look at our life, anything we've given up for Christ, we've really given up nothing, have we not? Uh, so anybody who gives up anything for the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus said you'll receive it back 100-fold, 100-fold. Well, here's another illustration of what it means to be a disciple. A disciple is illustrated by salt in verse number 34. So it says, salt is good, but if a salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And I want you to notice in chapter 15, verse number 1, who is hearing. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And that's going to be what we're going to be closing with is how do I get my salt back? Hey, you come to Jesus as a publican and you come to him as a sinner and you hear him and you cleave to his word and you will get your salt back. So where does the term, are you worth your salt, come from? Um, it, it is very interesting to, to see the etymology, uh, different expressions of different words and where they do come from. Uh, my, my dad was telling me, he was talking to him Saturday night, and uh, a, a mutual friend of ours, friend of the family, uh, Brother Ken Shavery, pastors down in Kentucky, they've had uh, COVID going through the church, like one assistant pastor got it, then another one, and a few families got it, and then he himself, was pastor, he got a COVID, so he had to be at home, he had to be quarantined, and then he was uh, having in to preach, in his absence, Don Sisk. Now, Don Sisk, maybe you never heard of his name, but he was the president of BIMI. Before that, he was just a very successful missionary in Japan. And Don Sisk is 90. And, I mean, this guy, he's, I mean, he's going full steam. He's going out in the saddle. I mean, he's just going full bore all the way to glory land. His wife just passed, I believe, about a year ago. Uh, and so he's just going full throttle all the way to heaven. So uh, Ken Shaver extends an invitation to Don Sisk. He says, hey, come preach for me Sunday. Don Sisk, who's 90, way in the red zone as far as risk for COVID, okay? Uh, says, yeah, absolutely, I'll come. 
And so he's talking to my dad and my dad said, you ever heard the expression, your name is mud? He said, well, let me tell you a story behind that. Uh, he said, there was a man by the name of John Wilkes Booth and he shot Abraham Lincoln in the back of the head. Then he jumped over uh, the theater booth there. And as he uh, landed on the stage, he hollered out, death to tyrants. But when he jumped, it wasn't as eloquent as he'd hoped for because his heel got caught in the drapes that hung over the booth and then he broke his leg. So as he was fleeing the state, there was a doctor who treated his broken leg while he was on the lamb. You know what his name was? Dr. Mud. And since then we have the expression, his name is Mud. Okay? It has nothing to do with the sermon, but I thought it was a pretty interesting story. So the Latin expression of salt or Latin name for salt is salary. Salary. So you work a job, you get salary. Uh, but salarium, salium, uh, has to do with salt. There was a time in the Roman army you got paid in salt because salt was of much value. So from somebody getting a salary who doesn't do his job, that person who doesn't do his job, who is given his salt, is not worth their salt. So there's something that you and I receive upon salvation as we receive the Holy Spirit, receive the Lord Jesus Christ into our life. We, we receive both light, as talked about in Matthew chapter number five, and then also salt. Ye are the salt of the world. And so there's a question to disciples that has the Lord given you your salt in vain or are you worth your salt? Let me read a couple of verses, Matthew 5, 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. Mark 9, 50. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. So the Lord says salt is is good. Here's three areas, and there's many, about 1,500 uses for salt, and we will not go over all 1,500 this evening, just three, okay? Wow. Number one thing is that salt was a preservative. Uh, fishermen, you know, don't take, you know, uh, Benjamin Franklin said about company that uh, fish and company stink after three days. You know, once you pull fish out of the water, they start decomping very, very quickly. Well, the Sea of Galilee was a bread basket there. Jerusalem ate very, very much fish. And so you can imagine these fishermen, one of, the, one of the primary jobs as you pulled your fish to shore after fishing all night is that you made sure that you get there in the Middle East where it's hot, hot sun, that you would get salt on your fish so it would preserve. Obviously, there was no refrigeration. There was no ice trucks. There was no way of preserving meat. The only, the only option you had for preservation was salt. So it's good as a preservative. It's good for seasoning. Amen. Pass the salt and the pepper. Job, the oldest book in the Bible, he understood this. Didn't take man too long to figure out this. Job said this, Job 6.6. 6. Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? You know what Job said? You know, if your wife cooks a bland meal, say, honey, will you please pass the salt and the pepper? And all of a sudden it's savory meal. The only way you can eat egg whites, put salt on them to add flavor. And we know the savor and salt, salt makes you want more. You ever get, you ever get uh, French fries and they forgot to add one and very important ingredient? The most important ingredient for French fries is salt. There's no salt in these fries. You can't eat, there, you cannot eat French fries without salt. How come you can only eat, you can't just only eat one Pringle? You know why? Salt. It leaves you wanting more. There is a savor. And last, Salt is a purifier. Turn, if you will, to Ezekiel chapter number 16. <clears throat> Ezekiel 
Ezekiel chapter number 16. How many have ever gone swimming in the ocean? How many, once you got in the ocean, you had a wound or a cut that you did not know that you had before you got into the water? Uh, what helped you realize that you had a wound or a cut? It was that salt in the water that was applied to that wound and it was going to do a purifying work. I really like Ezekiel chapter number 16. I preached from this uh, portion of scripture before and it's about God's great love towards his people and compares them to an orphan child. In Ezekiel chapter number 16 and verse number 4, the Lord says, For as for thy nativity, when you were born, in the day that thou was born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thou washed in water to supple thee, thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. Uh, one of the old customs as a child would be born is that they would clean the child and then they would salt the child for healing purposes any wounds or cuts or scrapes and then they would swaddle the child which we still do today and all that salt would be right against the child's body purifying that child and purifying any of the child's illnesses and so we see three distinct distinctives of salt and what it does it, it it's a preservative it adds seasoning and then also it is a purifier so salt as it pertains to christian turn back to our text there so salt is good point number two is a salty christian is good as well salt is good what are you and i supposed to be we are supposed to be salt and what is a salty christian he is good she is good for those that are around them let me remind you that salt is only good as it come in contact with others I have two illustrations of this andrew murray perhaps you heard of the name he was a missionary to south africa and he had a a farming community which he pastored and many of his parishioners would travel a, a long ways to church on Sunday and they, they, a lot of them could not come back out again at any time during the week because of the distance that they would travel and so what he did for them is he wrote many many devotionals for his church people and you and I uh, enjoy them today his books are were compiled for his church people that came out but uh, Andrew Murray about his life, he said, among those on whom his influence was the greatest were his children and grandchildren. Five of his six sons became ministers of the gospel, and four of his daughters became ministers' wives. Ten grandsons became ministers, and 13 grandchildren became missionaries. So in three generations, there was over 30 Murrays in the ministry from one man's life listen to this this is president woodrow wilson he's given an account of something that happened in a barber shop so here's woodrow wilson i was sitting in a barber chair when i became aware that a powerful personality had entered the room a man had come quietly in upon the same errand as myself to have his hair cut and sat in the chair next to me every word the man uttered though it was not in the least didactic showed a personal interest in the man who was serving him and before i got through with what was done to me i was aware that i had attended an evangelistic service because dl moody was in that chair I purposely lingered in the room after he had left and noted the singular effect that his visit brought upon the barber shop. They talked in undertones. They did not know his name, but they knew something had elevated their thoughts and felt that and I felt that I left that place as I should have left a place of worship. He said those barbers didn't even know 
who is in their midst. Uh, but President Woodrow Wilson, who, who was not a believer, I do, do not think from any of his uh, policies or any of his writings, but he recognized the fact that the man D.L. Moody elevated everybody that was in the room. And when he left that barbershop, he said it was like leaving a place of worship. Uh, no man is an island. Everybody has people around them who they come in contact with, and we affect them either positively or we affect them negatively. You know, Christians are to function in three ways, like as unto soul. Number one is that you and I are to be a preservative. So we live in a fallen world. Everything's in decline. I mean, uh, the globe is spinning less and less every single year. Uh, we're losing the moon. The moon is leaving the earth. Uh, the sun uh, shines less and less brightly year after year. This is a law of entropy. And so apart from, you know, the life-giving, eternal words of Christ and the Holy Spirit that is within us, you and I, apart from God, are a part of the declining system that is around us. No country lasts. No currency lasts. Uh, no constitution ever lasts. And so no form of government ever lasts. Everything is in decline. And there's only one thing that can preserve humanity around, and that is God's people. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a uh, preacher, in the mid-1900s, uh, just a, a great prince of preachers and preached at the West, Westminster Chapel in London, England. And uh, he said that before World War I, in the era of modernism, he said you could not, you could preach it, but people didn't believe that mankind was getting worse and worse. He said when World War I happened, they thought, well, you know what, maybe mankind, my, mankind is pretty bad. And then World War I was a piece of history and you know mankind uh, had experienced the war to end all wars world war one and then world war ii happened and he says you know after world war one then world war ii i didn't have a hard time convincing people that mankind is waxing worse and worse and there's only one thing that is going to preserve mankind the attributes of christianity are going to be the only thing, and the attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to provoke good works, hard work, honesty, integrity, loving neighbors, uh, loving your enemies, and loving lost people around you. The only thing that's going to preserve a Judeo-Christian ethic in society, like the family, like the home, uh, like uh, children and uh, parents and parents and children and husband and wives is going to be the Christian who is salt. The only thing that's going to suppress bad behavior, language, and dishonesty is going to be Christians who are salt. Uh, remember that for 10 righteous people, God would have spared Sodom. Only 10. And remember, you know, Lot, you know, if he's backslidden. You know, all the years he spent in Sodom, he could, he could have led 10 people. He could have been a soul winner and led 10 other people to Christ. Yeah. I mean, at least of all, he could have started a church or something like that down in Sodom. I mean, they needed it, right? Uh, but he wasn't there. He's there as a carnal Christian, and he was conformed to the world. He was not salt, uh, and he lost, he, he lost uh, the testimony of those that are around him. And then worse than that, he lost the testimony of his family. Uh, and his testimony was ruined. And then God, by way of illustration, uh, as they're leaving the city, his wife turns around in remorse over leaving the world, and she is turned into a pillar of what? Salt. Salt. As God, by way of illustration, said, this is what you should have been in that ungodly city, and I could have preserved that city. Before God destroyed the world in the flood, uh, he said this in, in Genesis 6, 3. My spirit shall not always strive with man. You know, you and I, as Christians, do a striving work by the Spirit of God that we strive with mankind, and we are a restrainer 
of the evils that are around us. One day, Church of God, gone. No more restrainer. And immediately the wickedness will abound on the earth. We're to be a preservative to those that are around us. I remember when I was working in the meat department, uh, my boss, Barbara Rayner. Barbara was about as tall as I am. Shoulders were, I think, broader than mine. Uh, her hands, I mean, if I held my hands up to her hands, her hands like that much bigger. I, she, I would not want to get in a fight with Barbara. She'd worked in the meat department for decades. And, uh, man, I remember one time picking up her knife on the table and started cutting meat with it. And it was wearing my shoulder out. The thing was so dull. And she's been standing there and cutting meat with that dull knife. All day. And I'll tell you, there's a big difference between cutting with a dull knife and a sharp knife. And, uh, man, Barbara, she was a tough and rough gal. I mean, and she, she could tell war stories on the weekends. I mean, she was 60 years old, uh, but she lived like she was 21. I mean, in living in a fraternity. And she, she would come in to the meat department after going to Bible college all day, you know, being fed the word of God, coming to the meat department. And Barbara's language of being a gutter, her stories of being a gutter. Uh, and I worked with another Christian named Scott Oden. And Barbara did respect my Christianity, and she did respect Scott's Christianity. And so she'd be in the meat department. She's a singer. Her, her son is a singer, too. Her son actually moved to Nashville to cut a, a record, you know, and actually had a record out there. Like a bunch of cowboys go out to Nashville, try to, try to make it. And, of course, he ended up moving back, like most of them. And, uh, and so he went out there. But she'd be in the back singing uh, some old Western or country song. And then she'd see, she'd see Scott and I rolling in for the shift. I said, well, my two preacher boys are here. Amazing grace. And she starts singing back there in the meat department. And this always came to my mind. Is here is a woman that would never sing Amazing Grace except she was working alongside of two Christians. And so she tries, and then she, of course, let one fly. She cut her hand or something. And, oh, I, I'm sorry. She would apologize to us. You don't need to apologize to me. You didn't take my name in vain. And, and, and there was a preservative that is, that is going on. And that's the way that you and I are supposed to be in society. There's also not only preservative, preserved it but a seasoning um in psalm chapter number 37 it says this the little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked you say why is it um i got a picture at home i mentioned it a few times by way of illustration and so my my mother actually bought me this picture i didn't have it but i'd always say, i've referred to it i was preaching it's an old guy, it's a chalice on the table, and there's just a simple loaf of bread, poor man's food. And he's got his head bowed in prayer. A little that the righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. Here's the reason why. is because a righteous man has a way to season his food. You know what it says about the wicked? is that their consciences are seared as with a hot iron. That, you know, you know why lost people um, have to go out and tie one on on the weekend? Uh, you know why they have to add fornication upon fornication upon fornication? Uh, you know why they have to go through uh, just marriage after marriage after marriage and try sin and iniquity after iniquity and uh, have to uh, try drugs and or or maybe they apply themselves to business and think man if I just made an, another million dollars or if I just own this company and own that company then I would be satisfied and then I would be happy and then I would have the peace uh, and then things would taste to me is because they do not have the salt of the Lord Jesus Christ in their life a poor man but a righteous man has the power to enjoy those things that are around them. Um, you know, it's funny. Your kids are little ref reflections of yourself, are they not? I tell you what, um, that little girl right there, she is a shopper. She can, she can figure out a million in one ways to spend her parents' money. 
The boys, not so much. But I mean, this girl is constantly thinking and constantly asking. And, and we're kind of trying to remind her, as we have to remind ourselves day after day, um, you ought to be happy with what you have. You know, your flesh, there's no satisfaction inside of your flesh. But you know, you die to the flesh and live to the spirit. You can be satisfied with nothing just you and the lord jesus christ and you can sit down and eat your poor meal with your poor family and your poor house and be so thankful and grateful to god and truly richly enjoy all that god has set before you where the rich man cannot be satisfied with all of his wealth you know why there is no salt and so here's what happens when you see a believer and you work alongside a believer who finds satisfaction in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, there is a savor to their life that they themselves do not have their speech is different than the world's speech here's what it says in Colossians 4 6 let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt that ye may know how to answer every man you know, it's your responsibility, it's your duty, it's your obligation. It says, the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And that we are to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us. That inside of us, there's supposed to be a well of water flowing up that we would water the souls that are around us. You have a duty and obligation and responsibility to properly answer those that are around you at work. Let me tell you something is that a Christian ought not to be cussing like a lost person. A Christian's mouth ought to be different than a lost person's mouth. And that a Christian's mouth ought to be edifying and it ought to be grace giving and grace abounding and we ought to speak blessings upon those that are around us and you know why you were saved is because you were in an association with a christian that you knew that they had something that you did not have and you were interested in it you know about the potato chip you can't you have just one you work with unsaved people who come and get a little taste of your Christianity. I mean, this is the way it goes. Okay, that's enough. I'm not going to have any more. That's what they say. Potato chip, right? They come back. Well, what about this? Uh, then they have a problem. They can, can you tell me this? What does the Bible say about this? You know what they're doing? They're coming around and they're taste testing that believer. And, you know, your responsibility and my responsibility is to lift the atmosphere in the room. D.L. Moody comes in and Woodrow Wilson says it was like being in a worship service. That man elevated everything that was in the room. You and I ought not to be a black hole. I remember my dad one time, he was out door knocking, he said, uh, and the guy answered the door. And he was making casual conversation. A lot of times, you do, oh, that's a lovely garden you have out there, Mrs. So-and-so. And man, you know, and you start on the small stuff and then you work your way to, um, you know, spiritual things that anyone ever show you from the Bible. So the guy said something about working at Garlocks, and that's a company over there in Wayne County. And my dad, trying to find common ground with this guy, he said, oh, yeah, he's one of our church members works there. And he named the guy's name. And the guy behind the door said, oh, you mean whiner. <laughs> Hard ground. Uh, to go ahead and tell somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ when you got whiner representing the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you and I are to elevate those that are around us. Our speech is to be seasoned with salt. And then finally this, is just as the Lord found Israel, swaddled Israel, her insulted her and cleansed her that the lord jesus came to bind uh, up the brokenhearted and to heal those that are wounded that you and i are to be a purifier you know what it says in proverbs faithful are the wounds of a friend but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful you and i are to have healing words you know, our speech is to be seasoned with the life-giving purification of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
people ought to know what we believe about the Lord Jesus. They ought to know about our testimony. The Lord says uh, that we are to be witnesses of him. Witnesses just tells what he has seen and what he has heard and what he has experienced. I'm supposed to tell everybody about how I came to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are to hear what, uh, what I know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They ought to know what I believe about their soul. As that, listen, the Lord Jesus Christ loved you so much as that he offered unto you the eternal gift of salvation. The expression of love was this, is that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I love you and God loves you and God wants you to receive his son as savior. And the Bible says that by the words of the righteous multitudes of iniquity are covered. Your iniquity was covered when someone showed you the Lord Jesus Christ and you came to him and your sins were forgiven. Finally, this, are you worth your salt? Look at verse number 34. Salt is good, but if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Occasionally, the, the preserving qualities, the purifying qualities, the savor qualities of salt would be leached out, and you couldn't do anything with the salt. The salt was worthless. So the question is given, um, Christian, are you worthless or are you worth your salt? He said, have salt in yourselves. You know, there's times for you and times for me that we have failed utterly in being salt. You know, sometimes we're like an artesian well springing up. I, I was uh, witnessing to somebody uh, just, just a month ago. It's funny, I was, went into this uh, chiropractor's office and this gallon asked me a question. And... Um, you know, every once in a while, you know how sometimes the Lord puts stuff together and then you tell somebody something you didn't even know you knew? And, um, and she's doing all these, like, observing it. I was giving it. And then I was coming out of the office and uh, my mom was coming in. And we just, I didn't know she was going to be there that day. She's coming in. I was, I was going out. And um, she called me later. She said, did you talk? I was like, yeah, yeah, I did. And she asked me this, and I told her this. I mean, I think really, I mean, I think the Lord gave it to me. Don't you love those moments? Aren't you embarrassed that those are few and far between? Then instead of being like an artesian well, we're kind of like the old, old school pump where you have to go over and somebody asks us a question, we got to get there and we got to pump and pump and pump and pump and nothing's coming out and nothing's coming out and you got to pour a little bit of water down there to prime it and then pump and pump and pump and then finally it's coming out. You know, that's not the way that the Lord intended for us to be. And so when we lose our soul, I'll give you an illustration. We, we had a lady in, when I was working in the meat department, in produce, and she had lost her son, he's like 17 years old, on a motorcycle accident. She was, he was riding a dirt bike and he hit a tree and died. And so you can imagine how absolutely devastated she was. Now this is down in Oklahoma City and I, I was newly saved. I guess I kind of knew this, but I was ignorant at the same time. Is that you know, 95% um, of the people in Oklahoma City, I'll just have you know, they are safe. In about I'd say 80% are Baptists. And I'd say about 100% have an uncle that's a Baptist preacher. I mean, you know, and so they all know the lingo. And so I remember one of our faithful customers, Connie, she come in several times a week. And I knew, I knew the church that she went to. She had told me she'd went to church. And so I knew that she knew the gal in produce because she shopped there many times a week. Connie was very friendly. She'd come talk to us. Uh, that this gal, this gal who shopped there, I had been to her house, I'd met her husband. Her husband dropped dead on Easter Sunday of a heart attack. They're getting ready for church, tying his tie, massive heart attack, died. And so this is like a year later, and, and Connie, 
went to the Baptist church, and so she knew, I mean, she knew the lingo and everything. And I said, Connie, you know so-and-so? I can't think of her name. In the produce, I told her how she lost her son. I said, she's having a real hard time because she doesn't know the Lord. And I was kind of like saying, Connie, maybe you can... And I remember the blank stare that I got from Connie, like, doesn't know the Lord, like... And I, all, all of a sudden, I realized, you don't know the Lord either, Connie. <laughs> but you know what I was trying to do? Is I was trying to put one lost person in contact with a Christian who was salty. We've all known those people who are attractional people. And here's what I mean. Not attractional to themselves, but attractional to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've known those saints of God that are always a refreshment and a joy to be around. And they always give you a taste of being close to the Lord. If you're backslidden, man, no salt just seeps into your wounds, does it not? And you're under conviction. Uh, and, and then also gives you an appetite for the Lord Jesus Christ and draws you to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's nothing greater that you can do for somebody else. Say, hey, why don't you get to know this person? And you put salt in contact with someone who needs salt, and it does something. Well, here's how to be salty. Last, and we're done. Look at the bottom of verse number 35. So Jesus said this many times in the, in the Gospels. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. There's only two groups of people in the Gospels, those who have ears and those who do not. And so verse, chapter 15, verse number 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. You know what I have to do continuously? And you and I have to get in the habit of continuously doing coming and drawing nigh to the Lord Jesus Christ as publicans and sinners and hearing him. You know what the answer is, folks? And um, is to continually put ourselves in remembrance and reminding ourselves of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and meditating upon this book right here and opening it up and not going through some sort of ritualistic reading, but actually uh, letting the words of the Lord sink down into our ears and into our heart. And that is how we get our salt back, depending upon the Lord Jesus Christ and approaching him to rejuvenate us and to make us salty creatures, make us salty Christians. Salt is good. It's good as a preservative. It's good as a seasoning. It's good as a purifier. And that's what we are supposed to be. Let's, let's pray together tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. Amen. And we thank you for the challenge to be salt. And I think of where you said, be salt and be light. Lord, many, many times we fail you again and again and again. But Lord, we're thankful for the times you allowed us to be salt. We're, we're thankful for the times that you allowed us to be light. Lord, I pray that those times would be more and more abundant in our life. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as these publicans and sinners in chapter number 15 uh, approach you. Lord, I pray that you would approach, we would approach you constantly, continuously, that we would abide in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would be the salt that we need to be, that we could be good salt. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together tonight, and we'll just close with a hymn. And our song leader from all the way in the back sound booth, would you come forward and lead us in a hymn tonight? We'd like to invite everyone out to our Red, White, and Blue Sunday. That's coming up this September 20th, 2020. And we're going to be honoring all the first responders, military, police, fire department, EMTs. And we're going to have a very special speaker that day, Medal of Honor recipient Gary Bikirk. Uh, and he's going to be addressing the crowd that morning. We'll have special uh, elected officials that will be here. They as well are going to be honoring our special guests. And after the service that morning, uh, all of our honored guests will have the opportunity to have a steak luncheon with Gary Biker. And so if you're a first responder, I hope you come. Let us honor you that day. And then also, if you know any first responders, please invite them. And even if you don't, if you come, 
and hear one of our country's national treasures, Gary Biker, speak, I know that it'll be a blessing to you. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching the sermon today. We'd like to express our thanks to you by sending you this book right here. It's called Done. What most religions do not teach you about the Word of God. It's about how you can have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would email us at mylbbc at gmail.com, we'll be sure to get that out to you. Also, if you'd like to find out more information about us, uh, here in the ministry of the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church, you can find us on the web at lbbc.info. Uh, there at the website, you can find out about our ministries. If you'd like to give to this ministry, you can do so there. If you'd like to reach out to us by mail, you can find us at 48 South Estate Drive, Webster, New York, 14580. God bless you. Make sure that you like this video, subscribe, and share. If you do that, we'd appreciate that. God bless.